thank you all for joining us. It seems like we have a diverse audience out there. So that's, that's exciting for us. Um, let me play this slideshow before I start talking. And feel free to um, ask any questions and we'll answer them as we go along. Yeah, that way, you know, if there's things that we need to cover in more detail, we can kind of do that while, while we're talking about that topic, but then there'll also be time for questions at the end too. Um, and then we also have the chat box open. That's how you'll ask us questions. Um, I see that Nima has her, her hand up right now. So if there's questions, they'll go into the box. You guys don't have audio um, and then we'll, we'll answer them with audio though. So, all right. Cool. So we are um, entering into our 12th growing season. Um, we started growing uh, veggies and flowers and the market kind of just directed us into uh, growing and selling uh, exclusively cut flowers. Um, so about five or six years ago, we quit growing veggies and went to 100% cut flowers. We grow on about 20 acres of annual crops and then about three quarters of an acre um, in greenhouses. Yeah. So right now we've got heated greenhouses and unheated. Our season goes from about March through November with flowers, then we do Christmas wreaths in December. So right now we're kind of in a break where January, February, there's not really a whole lot blooming. There may be a few things like the stock that's blooming right now was supposed to be for Christmas. So, you know, still trialing to try to get things to bloom right now, but um, it's hard. Columbus is like the fourth or fifth, like cloudiest city. Um, so, you know, it's like Portland and Seattle and Cleveland and Buffalo and Columbus, like right up, right up there. So winter growing is hard, not just because it's cold, but because it's gray. Very gray. Yeah. So, um, all right. So we're just going to get started. We'll keep talking about us, well, you know, a lot throughout, throughout the thing. Um, so today we're going to talk about strategies for developing customer relationships. So we are going to talk about our sales outlets as far as they apply to flowers, but you know, a lot of these like strategies talking about customer service and the way we communicate with our customers, I feel like it's applicable to people that are farming all kinds of different things. Um, you know, our florists are similar to like how your relationship would be with a restaurant and then grow, right. you know, we sell to grocers and, and so do people that are farming other things and, and then our wholesalers would kind of be like selling to a distributor um, or selling to like an institution, like, a, you know, a college or something that has multiple, multiple places that they're distributing it to. Um, yeah, so we're excited to be here. Right. Let's see if I can, here we go. So this is a graph of our sales outlets. Um, You'll see that the florist sales, direct to florist sales make up about 36%. Uh, and then grocery stores is about 16%. Um, farmers markets are 12%. We have a little on-farm shop that we'll talk about, just a self-serve shed, basically, um, that, um, that we do quite a bit of sales out of, too. Yeah, and that's really grown over the past couple of years. Um, and, and, you know, our business has changed. When we started, we were um, just doing farmer's markets. And then we, from there, started selling to grocery stores. Um, when we started in, we started in 2006, 2007, um, you know, in 2008, when the economy, like, was going down florists were going out of business so our business at that point was built around grocery store bouquets because that's where people were getting their flowers and um you know now our we used to be about i would say maybe 40 or 50 yeah. percent grocery sales um now it seems like florists are doing better and the grocery sales aren't as as good as they used to be so we have this diversified you know, plan so that way as one thing, as one thing wavers, there's something else to sort of help fill that gap. Um, you know, also the business changes, changes each year just based on what's 
happening. You know, we pick up new accounts through having more flowers than we know what to do with at some point and then going out and, and ac acquiring more accounts. So every year we talk about how, you know, we're not trying to grow more, but then we sort of just naturally do. Um, because when we go through crop planning, we're like, we could sell more of that and we could, we could do more of that. Um, we also started shipping flowers. So that's the shipping charges collected. That's a part of a part of our florist sales. Um, and weddings. There's lot, lots of different things that kind of compile. The other income is things like this, talking, um, doing bouquet classes, those kinds of things, presentations. Um, so how do you find out what's right for you? So, you know, everybody's in a different area. I know some of you may be more rural since we are in Columbus, you know, we do have the, the benefit of being close to a city that has a lot of grocery stores, um, has, you know, multiple florists around, but some of you that are further out may have a further drive to get to a, you know, a place where there are more people. Um, but so we just, you know, how would you figure out what was right for you? That would be identifying the opportunity at your location, like figuring out, you know, doing some market research, where are the florists, where are the grocery stores, where are like, you know, where are the good farmers markets? Um, or is there a college town nearby? One of ours is in a college town that's actually 45 minutes out of the city. Um, that's one of our mar farmers markets that we do. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in a city hub you know, there's some of our florists are in that town too, that are it's 45 minutes out. So. And we started, when we started, we had, we started selling to, there's five different grocery chains um, that we sell to in Columbus. And then there's three or four other grocery chains that we don't sell to. Um, so we just knew that for our location, the grocery stores were the way for us to kind of get in and try and sell as much product as possible just to get our kind of, feet wet um, while we figured out the rest of our our future but um, and then we then we switched over to florists and kind of that's been our focus over the last few years yeah so then are there certain crops in high demand in this slide is ranunculus which is a very hot item in, in the flower world so you know that's something that typically takes growing in structures so is there a need for season extension you know figuring out like what your market is so is if that means going into florists and talking to them and figuring out you know what they would what they would want to buy that you could grow you know start starting out with like sunflowers and i think we're the first thing that we started selling to them sunflowers and zinnias yeah. and like larksford cosmos and things like that um you know as we were just starting with the annual stuff out in the field so find your niche and figure out what you want based on your personality. So if you're somebody that doesn't really like to talk to people, um, then maybe the farmer's market isn't for you. Maybe being more wholesale, being, being more behind the scenes, you know, is, is a better avenue. Um, if you don't want to have a lot of employees, then like thinking about the scale that you want to be at and what, how much you want to be responsible for. So. And really just spending a lot of time figuring out what it is you want to do now and what it, where it is you want to be in the future and, and, and having that guide you as far as what you get into. Um, and I do see your question, Amber, about wholesalers versus a florist. So we are going to, we are going to talk about wholesalers um, sales when we get through to the sales outlet. So we will answer that question. Right. So, um, estimating capacity, how much can you produce on the land that you have, or do you have access to more land? Um, you know, that determines a lot. Um, you know, figuring out what scale you're striving for. Do you, like she said, do you want to have employees? Do you plan to do season extension? Um, um, think about taking land out of production, resting it, rotating crops, some of those things can really kind of dictate how much you can actually grow on your land. Yeah, so here we're on 10 acres 
and we are considered Columbus because we're right inside the outer belt, but we're sort of right on the edge. And so when we outgrew the space that we have here on the home farm, you know, we started looking at places around here to rent um, originally to buy, but everything around here that is close is zoned for development and not within our price range. So, so renting became the, you know, more feasible option. So this picture here is from like our, the rented field. So we went from here at the home farm doing um, like 75 or 150 foot beds to at the rented farm doing beds that are like 400 feet long. Um, so it really expanded our capacity at that point. We sell to a grocery distribution center that can take a lot of bouquets. And so that's a lot of what's out in these fields, the summer annuals over at the rented space. Whereas at the home farm, um, it's more perennials and greenhouses um, that we wanted to be here on the plot of land that we own. Um, uh, we are not certified organic. We are, we, there's a couple of pesticides that we use on the farm that aren't organic. Um, Other than that, yeah, I mean, all yeah. our fertilizer and stuff is, is organic. Yeah, use a no lot of compost, no herbicide, IPM, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then based on what you decide your capacity is, you know, crop planning for your projected sales and make sure that your crop planning um, uh, would include like how much money do you need to make. So we use a crop planning book um, that's called Crop Planning for Organic Vegetable Growers. It comes with a set of templates in Excel. Um, and... Um, Sorry, I'm reading the chat box it. at the same time. I'm getting distracted. Um, but the, the crop planning book comes with a set of Excel templates and it has you start out with how much money do you want to make? And then from there, how much money do you need to make based on what your expenses are going to be? Um, yeah, will you type out what the, what the book is, is called there? Okay. So yeah. It's called Crop Planning for Organic Vegetable Farmers. You're talking to just Maggie too. Um, if you go to the Growing for Market like bookstore, it's in the Growing for Market thing. And we have written articles for Growing for Market also. Um, so if you don't subscribe to that, there is a lot of, I think we've written over 30 articles. Um, so you can get lots of books. There are lots of good books there and um, yeah access to our articles but um, so that's where the crop planning stuff comes from sorry the, the chat box is really distracting um i'll handle the chat box okay you handle the chat box um and then uh over the moon asked what were the pesticides i believe and it is evergreen which is a pyrethrin but the chemical that there's a chemical in it that keeps the pyrethrins active for longer than than uh, Pyganic or any of those pyrethrins. Um, and then Endeavor, which is what we use for aphids in the greenhouse. And that's something that is like, it works well with IPM stuff. Um, if you're in the Association for Specialty Cut Flower Growers, the ASCFG, um, they have a guy that's in the association named Stanton Gill and he, is kind of our go-to pest guy. So Endeavor was one of the things that they um, suggested that we used when we had aphids in the greenhouse and um, like the triac, the neem oil and like self oil and things like that weren't, weren't doing enough. Um, all right. Oh, there was one last one. Oh, can I go back? There we go. And then just thinking about your own capacity for organizing the chaos. So that's, you know, farming is, there's a lot going on all at the same time. So the more diversity of crops you have, the more people that you have, um, you know, that's more management and like, what, what are you really willing to, to take on and handle? Like we didn't ever think that we would, would be this this big? It wasn't in the goals, you know. But the the far the market has been there, and the business has been successful. So we just kind of keep pushing it, um, and I guess we'll, we'll figure out how big is is too big when we get there. Be able to click on that. Okay. 
so then our highest gross sales by product 2019 so this is probably the most uh appealing to the the flower farmers out there um but mixed bouquets being our number one item so we grow a ton of different types of of flowers in order to make the bouquets um so there's lots of fillers and foliage and focal flowers kind of throughout every time of season dahlia tubers so that's what we're currently selling online that's kind of what helps us keep employees on through the winter um i just saw someone asked how many employees do you have so in the summer we have like we had 17 employees this year um and then right now we have Six, six yeah six to eight some of them are you know only a couple of days a week right now while we're in like winter hours and then we'll go back usually we go back to more full time once the tulips start blooming um which is like the end of march beginning of april so right now we take off fridays which is really nice and then there's not saturday markets so this is kind of a change change in pace right now um, most of our mixed bouquets are going to grocery stores, um, and then I'd say 80% go to the grocery stores and then 20% retail, probably. Yeah, to the farm market. Um, someone asked us stands. where we sell most of our mixed bouquets. Someone else just asked us, uh, do we start our own Lizzie's or buy plugs? We buy, we don't rely on our Lizzie's that we start. Those are just extra. <laughs> we buy most of them. We try to start them, but it doesn't, it doesn't always work out, so um they just take a really long time okay so then dahlias ranunculus wedding sales lisianthus tulips zinnias celosia eucalyptus stock anemones sunflower snaps so that is um you know all of the all of our top crops there eucalyptus we grew a ton of eucalyptus this year and we're planting even more this year um we grew a ton of eucalyptus last year planting even more this year but um, it was something a nice, like sturdy foliage. A lot of the foliage, if you're in the flower farming world, a lot of foliage we can grow, dusty miller, cynodrinums. It's kind of floppy when it's hot. So it's nice that the eucalyptus is a nice, like sturdy thing and it's got a long season. Um, we do the yeah, wedding. Yeah, repeat the question. We, um, someone asked about selling, um, doing wedding arrangements in bulk or doing the arranging. Well, we do both. And we're going to talk about wedding sales yeah. too. Do you sell your bouquets at the grocery stores? Is your income based on how many are sold? We sell, yeah, we, we sell them outright. So they they buy them from the us. Like they don't, it's not consignment or anything like that. The, they, they buy what they order. And then eucalyptus, uh, we start the majority of our eucalyptus and buy in some, as backup and we grow our eucalyptus in the field and in the greenhouses. All right, so then we're gonna talk about retail sales outlets. So the farmer's market is where we started. Um, I think it's a great place to put a face to the name and be a part of the community. Um, you know, we used to do multiple farmers markets throughout the week. Once we started doing wholesale sales, we cut back to just a Saturday market. Um, we are in a college football town. So if there is a rainy Saturday and then a noon Buckeye game, like sometimes Saturday markets can, can be rough. Um, so that's sort of when we knew, you know, in the beginning of us growing flowers, we knew like we needed something else besides just farmers markets. So um but it's still we still go to two um every saturday and we try to stay connected with our customers during the off season so we collect emails for a newsletter um and now you can join our mailing list like on our website and so that's our way to communicate with our local people for having specials or having events um we do a holiday open house the first week in december and so that's markets are like typically over at that point so that's sort of our last last push um for sales and so it's nice to have that newsletter to to keep in touch with everybody um and then utilize utilizing social media to keep them in the loop so we're going to talk about the different like social media outlets a little bit more towards the end um i found personally that the local people tend to be more on facebook whereas like our internet like our national people 
tend to be more on Instagram. Um, it is like crossing a little, it is crossing a little bit more, um, but it is, it does, social media seems like it takes a lot of time, but it, it has been worth it for us to communicate. Um, someone asked where we find and how we find our seasonal help. Um, you know, we don't really, we don't, have, we don't hire too often for seasonal help. We have uh, four guys on an H2A program that come up from Mexico every year. Um, and then the other people we hire, and usually there's one or two people that have been here for a year or two that are kind of leaving at the end of the season. And then the, some of the people we hire, we keep on because if we like them, we want to keep them on as long as possible. We don't want to lose any good employees. So um, it's kind of just a rotation. Our office lady is seasonal, um, but she comes back every year. So um, generally, if we hire somebody and they're good, um, we're going to try and keep them around all winter. And then if they kind of stink, then we kind of let them go. <laughs> But that's why season extension is also such a big part of our business with the greenhouses. That means more winter hours with the tuber sales. That means more winter hours. So um, that's definitely been something that we've built up over time, being able to like, you know, retain employees by providing them some winter work. Um, and then some of the employees are only working two days a week during the winter. One girl works five, another girl works four, another girl works three, and the other I guess I missed Brittany, but yeah. the other two work <laughs> yeah. um, two days a week. So, so nobody's full time right now. But my goal is for the people not to have a to go get another job because I found that when I have somebody work for me two or three days a week and then they have another job, that they're usually just as exhausted by the end of winter because they've been working two jobs. So my goal is for people not to have to go get a second job. I'll give them extra days if they need to get another job. Um, someone said eucalyptus variety preference, so baby blue, um, silver drop, which the florists call gunny. Uh, I think that's the, what we mainly do, but we always grow a few weird ones too because we do some from seed. So we um, get, do some of the like willow uke and stuff like that. Some of the weird ones just don't grow as fast. So um, our favorite place to source plastic bouquet sleeves. We use Abru, um for a lot of stuff. And then we just got sleeves printed um, with our branding, which you'll see in another slide. And so those came from Flamingo Holland. They're like a Dutch supplier and they, they printed them for us, <clears throat> which was a big, made a big difference because, um, oh, he's gonna, oh, it's Aru. Sorry, oh, I, it, I, I know it what it is. Um, okay. So as far as farmers markets go, you know, we really, we really try to up our game this year. We got these maple syrup buckets. So we got all clean tablecloths, really tried to make it like more of an experience for people. Um, we so also raised our prices. So we wanted it to, we wanted to look better than it did last year because we did a big price increase on bouquets. Yeah. So we went from bouquets were $16 to now they're 20. And so we wanted people to have like that same perceived value. And it was very well received this year. Um, the, the, the customers were saying, you know, oh, it looks like, you know, it's got more of like a flower shop feel and stuff. So I think kind of, you know, if you want to charge a little more for your bouquets, then having the display, not having it look so farmy, you know, not with like the, the checkered tablecloth and um, like cardboard signs and things like that. Um, so we use these signs that we paint chalkboard paint. Here's just another another example of um, of the display here. Lots of galvanized tins, nice clean tablecloths, um, and then on the right, those are bouquets that are just unsleeved for a special order. So we do that also. So then here's the farm stand. So this year, it used to just be a little lean-to. And before that, it was a hay wagon. So this is actually version three of the farm stand. Easter sales went well. And so we said, um, we said, you know, we're gonna take this money and put it into buying, it's just like a prefab shed. 
Um, so this is our self-serve farm stand on the property. It's got pre-made bouquets, bunches of flowers, you know, wreaths during wreath season. So how it works is there's just a little cash box where people can pay with Venmo or PayPal. Um, and it works out really well. You find your people, you know, this is, it's been a few years now that we've been open. So the people that have been here before just know, know the deal and, you know, some will come and talk to you and other ones just come and get their stuff and get in the car and go. If they ever have special needs, they can always email us and we can do like, you know, special orders and stuff for parties and things like that. Um, but yeah, we're pretty excited that the self-serve thing worked because we didn't want to have to pay somebody to man a retail, um, retail booth. Um, someone asked if we would do a, a subscription sale of our flowers. Uh, we haven't, we've not done that yet. Um, so no. Um, How many stems per bouquet? Usually like a lily and 15 stems. And then do we primarily make all bouquets for sale or have loose? Everything that goes to the farmer's market or in the farm stand is all bunched, bunched and sleeved and ready to go. So we wanted people to have the same experience as they would have if they were going into the grocery store and seeing our flowers. And so that's why we started sleeving like with the sticker and everything. Um, so that's what this slide is, you know, always try to see it from the customer's point of view. So like if it, you know, I like to stand out from the stand and sort of like look at what it looks like as a whole um, to to see how like how they would view it. And then that's our sign at the at the entrance that we had made. Um, someone asked if we split the managerial responsibilities or if we have a general farm manager. Um, you know, every year we kind of edit the uh, operational chart that we have on the farm. Um, we are kind of currently looking for somebody that can be somewhat of a field manager. Um, but, you know, Gretel has the things that she's in charge of. I have the things that I'm in charge of. I'm the grower, the head grower. Um, so the greenhouses and the fields. Um, but then we have uh, two, two to four um, leaders, managers that we have that are team members that are in charge of different things. Um, as, as people kind of progress in the business, you know, we start to hand off more, more things to people so that they can take on more responsibility. Um, and actually that kind of segues into this. So this is our, we do wedding sales with full service. Um, we've got a minimum of $3,000. We do a la carte, so that's gonna for smaller events, but there's no delivery. Um, or you could buy flowers by the bunch for your own design. And this year, Emily, our far, one of our farm managers, took over the wedding part of the business from me. And it has been amazing, um, especially since I've been sick this year. It kind of came at the right timing um, for her to take it over. And it's nice to see that, like, you know, our designs can be going out. But I don't have to, you know, be always be fully responsible for them. And... Um, and she does great work. So we're really excited about how that part of the, the business has, has unfolded as far as, you know, giving someone that's a manager just kind of complete control over, over that. So she does all, all of the ordering, all of the consultations, all the emails, everything in the wedding part of the business. So um, someone asked if we do you pick, um, we're not doing you pick. Uh, yeah, I um, no you pick, and then do we do dry flower arrangements? We do. We dry as much as we possibly can, and then we buy a lot in from Charles Little Flower Company. Yeah, I think Bethany's on this uh, so. right now. So they do great stuff, and there's also um, Kramer's dried dried flowers. So some of the stuff is is supplemented from our other flower farmer friends if it's things that we can't grow enough of. We don't have a big barn like drying shed we just have the attic of of the barn that we've built and so we have to go up through a little like manhole um it's not yeah it's not very um very efficient way so someday we ha we have big barn big barn envy when we see barns like that that have all that space um this is just the wedding sales just communicating with the bride so uh we have a pinterest page each month has the availability in it the different types of flowers that we grow so that way brides can get a visual if they're doing all cart they're not um 
they're not, they don't get a consultation. And so this is kind of the way for them to see things that are blooming or we encourage them to follow us on social media too, because they are always posting what's happening then or previous weddings, things like that. Um, tuber and plant sales. We used to do a lot of herb plants and succulents and things. We've kind of dropped out all of those, all of those things. Um, and now we're just doing dahlia tubers. So that's, and we do sell some tulip bulbs, um, but the tulip, the tulip bulbs come from Holland. The dahlia, dahlia tubers are grown on, grown on our farm. So that's just another retail sales outlet. And then here's a dried flower wreath. So that's something that, um, you know, we sell a lot of online, but also in the fall. So after post frost is when dry flower wreath season starts happening. So it's a value added thing for us. Um, it's been a great addition, but there's other retail sales outlets that you could think of, you know, flower shop, funeral work, a CSA. Somebody asked us about the subscription collaboration with local businesses. Like, can you do a pop-up or, um, yeah, there's lots of opportunities out there. So just get, get creative. All right, where'd my clicker go? Here we go. Okay. So then if you're selling retail, you know, how, how do you get those customers? So, um, you know, developing those relationships for us, we, the reason why we fell in love with flowers is because people have like a nostalgic connection to them. They have like an emotional reaction to them. Um, which is pretty addicting because then it's like you're a part of those people's lives and in good times and in bad. Um, and so just getting to know your customers and, and building your community in that way. What's fun about doing weddings is, you know, they'll come to my holiday open house with their kids uh, when I did their wedding five years ago or whatever. So it's cool to kind of like build those, build those lifelong customers. Um, the farmer's market, like I said, is definitely where we started. This is a picture of a bouquet class that I did. So the ladies are welcome to like walk around the farm afterwards. This was during Dahlia time. So the field was like looking amazing at that point. Um, so I took a break from classes for a few years, but, but we're back at it. Um, farm tours. So we used to do a farm tour every year. Now that we have the on farm stand, people are welcome to walk around anytime the farm stands open. So we sort of cut out the like, fully guided farm tour part of the, um, of the season. Sorry. And then just getting local press. So we were in like Edible Columbus. Um, yeah, just trying to get your name out there. And then maintaining relationships, you know, through community outreach. So we did like an installation um, at an arts, an arts festival here in Columbus. Um, and that was really cool. We've actually gotten a couple weddings like from this installation and made a lot of cool connections with other artists in the area. Um, we did a pop-up shop at Madewell for Mother's Day. That's Emily, our, our wedding, wedding manager right now. Um, and then, yeah, like a block party installation. So we, by raising our minimum for the weddings, um, you know, kind of cut back on the number of weddings we were doing, but that sort of allowed us the opportunity to do more things like this in the community. And for me, that's, that's like what I enjoy is doing those big, weird installations and stuff. So just trying to reach new people and then branding your product. So here's our, here's our sleeve that we had printed. Um, there's a picture on a dirty table, but uh, of the paper sleeve with our sticker on there. So we have some accounts that prefer the paper sleeve. Um, so we do a little bit of both. And then also, you know, this is what I was talking about with the grocery stores, kind of wanting it to be the same, the same style of bouquet, the same look, so that way people can make that connection of like, oh, I saw your flowers at Giant Eagle. Um, having that continuity. And then this year we printed swag too. So that's, you know, another way that people can kind of support your business. And, and then it's always fun to see like one of those out in the wild, um, a Sunny Meadows shirt. Um, Someone knows, wants to know about a spring, uh, spring bouquet recipe. Um, so we grow LA lilies and there's, there's a lily in every bouquet. Um, and that is just for the customers perceived like value since it lasts the longest. So I would say 
Um, so it's like a lily and 15 stems usually. So like for a bouquet, we'll probably use this the, in the spring, the single stock. So the singles, there might be three of those, five ranunculus and, a, uh, and like, I don't know, five tulips. Is that it kind of just depends on what we have. Um, yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of times we're selling as much as we can to the florist in the spring. And then so what's left is uh, what we use in the bouquets. So, you know, some of the sex stock that is number twos or singles, uh, some of the smaller ranunculus. And if we feel like we have a lot of product that week, we'll make the bouquets a little bit bigger um, just to kind of help the customer feel like they're getting more value. Right. And Especially so, for the farmer's market people. Like yeah. If we've got a lot. We're like, we're going to bulk this up because they're yeah. the ones paying the highest price. They're paying $20. Um, do we do any kind of charity as a business? We do. So our bouquets that are unsold at the farmer's market on Monday go to a local food pantry. So the bouquets go out to the families there that utilize the food pantry. Um, and that's, yeah, really, really cool to hear about, you know, people that have never received flowers. Uh, someone asked about our walk-in coolers. Um, we have a 12 by 20 cooler that's off the side of the barn. Um, and then we just got a um, 24 foot trailer that we're converting into a, a walk-in. It was already insulated as an old reefer trailer. And then we have a, another walk-in that's 10 by 12 that we put our sunflowers in. But hopefully the sunflowers are gonna move into the trailer. Um, okay, so this slide is just to show that sometimes your sales outlets will determine your stage of harvest. So, you know, on the very right, those are ones that are going to go to florist. In the middle, those would be ones that would go to market. And then, you know, on, on the left, those are the ones that are the most open to be used in weddings. So having the different sales outlets, you know, really understanding with flowers or if you're growing veggies too, like the prime stage of harvest, you know, to have that like have the best quality. With wedding stuff, we can absorb the really open stuff because it really only needs to last a few days. Whereas, you know, stuff that you sell at the farmer's market, people want it to last at least through the week. And then to the florists or to the wholesalers, you know, there may be things that they sit in the cooler for longer before they get used. Um, or if they're going to the wholesaler, they want them really tight because they're going to go to the florist from them. Um, and so, yeah, just understanding that the different sales outlets will take, are going to take different, different things. Do we grow any edible flowers? We do not grow any edible flowers. Um, what price do you sell the mixed bouquets to the grocery store for? They're $9 to the grocery store. They come in a case of five. And we are going to talk about, I think the next slide is grocery sales. Um, so we do um, wholesale sales. So the people who are selling to the florist basically is another part of the business. So we're trying to increase. Um, that is the lowest. Uh, this is just wholesale. Okay. Wholesalers is the next slide. Sorry. Sorry. Wholesale sales outlet. So this, this is like florist distribution. This is all, all of the things. Um, good for building regular orders. So that's what I was talking about, not being dependent on the farmer's market. They need a separate pricing structure. So thinking about, and I have a slide about pricing, you know, thinking about if you're going to charge a florist $8 for a bunch, then it can't be $8 at the farmer's market. It needs to be more. You need to give your farm, you need to give your florist the opportunity to mark it up because that's what they want. You know, you want to make sure that they, they have a chance to make the money on the flowers that you're trying to sell them and you're not undercutting them, especially if you're selling in the same area. Um, we need an invoicing system. So, you know, once we started selling to grocery stores, that's when we needed, like we had a QuickBook so that the invoices looked official. You need standardized bunch sizes and then consistency is key. Like, so them knowing that your product is always going to last, your product is always going to look like this. Like the bouquets are something that we can do throughout the season. And we say it's like a a journey through the season because it's a one steady product but what's in it differs throughout the year um, but you know that bouquet is still the same size the same length like this so that the customer perceives the same value 
Um, someone asked about the best pest control on dahlias. Um, evergreen is what we use for cucumber beetles. And, and that's mainly the only pest we have in our dahlias. So um, we spray them with evergreen. And conserve, actually. Evergreen and conserve, I rotate those two. And then do we have a problem with Japanese beetles? Not really. They were they were a little bit worse this year than they have been in the past, but cucumber beetles are the are our biggest pest in the our, world. Our first four years, Japanese beetles were really bad. Yeah, once they knew that we were here. But then I think once there was enough for them to sort of spread out on the you they don't notice them as much. <laughs> um Okay, so developing relationships, building your wholesale customer base. So for us, you know, speaking with the floral buyer, so if you're going into, this is an example of an initial grocery email. So, you know, if you're going into a grocery store, the floral buyer is typically the head of stores and some, sometimes they don't, it just kind of depends. Um, tell your story, take in samples, leave a card, send a follow-up email with pricing and the UPC info and show them you can present your product in a professional manner. So that was something when we went um, to Whole Foods, they didn't yet have a local bouquet person and we left samples and left a card. And then, you know, they were like, well, you have to, you have to have UPCs and you have to have sleeves and everything has to have a case size like we weren't totally like prepared for all of that um so yeah just being ready to like to have all of those things to like make it official if you want to take the step into wholesale sales um quality control and consistency is key so this is an example of initial grocery email that we would send to people a case does equal a bucket somebody just just asked that question that's a good question um, the case is one of those like black buckets. Um, I think it's like, is it three gallons? I think it's three gallons, whatever the grocery stores have. So we've, we've never bought those buckets. We always just have our grocery stores accumulate them for us. Um, and then the, they'll give us like huge stacks of them because they typically just recycle them. Um, yeah, so it just says like, thank you for your interest in carrying our flowers. Um, talks about the order deadlines. It gives the case sizes, pricing, the UPC numbers, what the seasonal bunches are that have 10 per case and what have five per case. Um, that's just based on, you know, something that's a little bit like shorter and fatter. We can't really fit 10 per case. Um, and then all of our seasonal bunches are $5, but the number of stems that are in the bunch varies depending on on the product. Um, and I do have a slide for in the pricing slide that talks about the different bunch sizes for the Lysianthus. But basically they need a consistent price. So then what you have to do as a grower is either you're gonna sell them all 10 stem bunches, you know, and get less per stem, um, or like something with the Celosia, you know, if they've got really big heads, it might only be four, like four to seven stems in a grocer bunch instead of 10 for a florist. Carl asked, uh, uh, payment terms for grocery sales and wholesale. Um, net 30, ideally. Um, some of them kind of drag their feet, but, but net 30 is, is what the invoice says. And we start bothering them after 30 days. Yeah. Um, all right, so then grocery sales. We've already talked about things being sleeved, UPC, case size. Know that they're going to mark up a hundred percent. So you know whatever your price is, that's why like our price is nine dollars. We realize that we charge at the farmers market twenty dollars. So like there's some that don't mark up a hundred percent, and they were selling bouquets for fourteen ninety nine. And we told them, you know, we just raised our prices, so you're kind of you know competing with us. So could you please like raise them up a little bit higher so that way like our flowers aren't cheaper from from the grocery store. Um, we do mostly mixed bouquets for them. And then, yeah, you may have to get through a corporate office. So there are some mom and pop grocery stores. That's where I suggest that you start if you're looking to get into grocery, um, just because usually the person who is the buyer or who is in charge, like is, you know, the owner or whatever is there. Um, and that you can have more of a direct relationship with, but like with Giant Eagle, that was something that was corporate. 
you know, we went to Pennsylvania and met with the like corporate buyer before we could get in um, with them. So every store is different uh, based on what their rules are and how their like business structure is. And then with grocery sales, you know, just making sure that you have the space to like do that kind of volume. So this is inside the barn on a rainy day in June, and we're making the grocery store bouquets there. So lilies, sunflowers stay on the ground and then the things get laid out on the table and then you go down, um, you know, uh, and assembly line style, chop them at the end. And then the guy in the back is the expediter. So the finished bouquets go on the cart and then they get sleeved um, and go into the buckets. You can see the buckets in the back, those, those case sizes over there. But time is money. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to lose efficiency when you're making bouquets, um, but you can't also ask people to not enjoy themselves. So it's a fine balance, but, yeah. but we try and keep it, um, the, the processing barn, everything works in a flow and a, in a, in a direction. And we try and just keep it moving. So Loud the goal music. is, yeah, the goal is a minute of bouquet. But um, you know, as people learn, it it takes those uh, takes people some time. You have to sort of learn how to design it, and then learn how to undesign it, so that there's kind of tricks of like picking up multiple stems and and doing things like that. Um, someone asked where we get those tall tables. They're from restaurant equippers. So if you have any like restaurant store around you, I'm sure that they sell, sell them and then they're up on casters so that they can roll around on the concrete floor, um, which is great for cleaning purposes or when we're, you know, packing dahlia tubers, we can make aisles or we have the open house, we can move them out of the way. Um, so it's nice because they're counter, counter height. And then this is just a pile of bouquets waiting for the expediter to sleeve them and, and get them ready for the grocery stores. So uh, with the florists, um, we communicate with them via text message, phone calls, or emails. Um, our, best, our best two florists really only communicate with us through phone call. I don't even know if they look at the weekly availability, but they buy a lot of flowers, so we're pretty patient with them. Um, we send out a weekly availability on Thursday for the upcoming week through MailChimp. Um, and then we will start making phone calls that following Monday for Wednesday delivery, or we have a fair amount of florists that pick up through the week. So we'll sell, we are selling the florists five or six days a week, um, talking to different ones put, that are putting in orders, but our main delivery route is on Wednesday. So we're making all those phone calls that we need to tie up on Monday. Yeah. So then using social media, again, to let them know what's blooming, um, you know, sometimes things will get sold just by them being, you know, on my Instagram story or something. And so that, that's really helpful to have a way to actually show people, especially since flowers are so visual. Um, but um, we also do a projected seasonal availability document. So this was based on originally we did a harvest log. So we would track the number of buckets that came in from the field to really track like when things flushed or if you have perennials, when the perennials typically bloom. Um, now we basically use our just our sales reports because we know, you know, if something was blooming, then that means that we, we were selling it um, to create that. And it changes a little bit every year based on new, new crops or changing the timing. Um, another form of communication, we're launching Shopify this year. We built it last year but um didn't launch it so this year this year is the year for hopefully our florists will be able to do some online shopping and that is just about accessibility you know we've got people that have kids and the only time that they can shop is late at night and they feel bad texting us and so this is like kind of the answer to that um and then great photo sell product so even if you're selling um you know, selling vegetables or selling livestock or whatever it is that you're selling, you know, taking good photos, showing the farm life, telling your story, like is all, all a part of it. Um, someone asked if we use preservatives. Uh, we use Chrysler products. Um, we use uh, number two, OVB. And um, so the number two is our, is a food 
And the OVB is a hydrator. And then we use the Zinnia pills. OVBN, is that that? No, uh, CVBN. CVBN, our little tablets. Um, we, are on, we have well water, so our water is not treated at all. And so the tablets are a slow release chlorine and Zinnia's are dirty flowers. So it just helps with the vase life um, with those. Um, let's see, we got a few questions. Do we sell patio planters? No, we don't, we don't do any plant sale kind of stuff. Um, how many floors do you sell to? Uh, it differs. So we have, we have, how many would you say you deliver to on a regular, like 15, 25, 20? 15 or 20. Yeah, that are on the regular like Wednesday route. Um, I think that there's a lot more on our um, availability list, but you know, not everybody orders every week. So with floor sales, I think that you kind of need a mix of designers and um, you need a mix of designers and shop florists. So the designers are good because sometimes they need a lot for a big wedding, but they might not need anything for the weeks in between. And so having those the standard shop florist ones that are doing the funeral work that are doing the daily like hospital arrangements and those kinds of things are really important for us to you know sustain the business in the weeks that aren't wedding weeks um okay so our methods we send a newsletter we do the calls calls text or check in email just kind of based on what is best for people um and then yeah, Tuesday a.m. is the last day to order for, for the Wednesday delivery. And then this year with Shopify, the goal is frictionless sales. So you just want it to be as easy as possible for them to buy as many flowers as they can. Um, so, you know, we're just always work, working towards that, how to better our customer service. That's quick responses to emails. We, we got a sales phone so that way they could text the sales phone anytime and not have to feel bad about texting us at 10 p.m. Um, and then we just get, you know, get it when we get back into the office. There's a lot. Um, okay. okay, let's say, we're going to answer some of the questions real quick. Um, thoughts on op management of operating expenses. Um, that's a whole other hour and a half. <laughs> that we would talk about with that um you know it's it's a struggle it's it farms can eat money and um that's yeah. why we keep pushing our sales is so that we can keep up but we do a lot of budgeting uh we do enterprise budgets we do cash flow we do a monthly cash flow and we actually do a daily cash flow to really kind of keep ourselves in check it's hard when you're making money in september and it feels like all the money is flying in um but really you need that money to make it through winter so really doing that like daily check-in for us is really important to just kind of keep it in line so that way we don't don't spend all our money before we go into winter um but yeah, I mean, farming farming is not a, not a cheap thing to do. And so really just budgeting and, and regulating your expenses is um, important. Someone said, uh, is Shopify, oh, and also, um, Carl, we do farmer consultations too. So if it's something that you're interested in getting more like numbers and details or whatever, we, we will like share that information with people too. Um, we just don't have, don't have time right now. Um, is Shopify only for your florist? So we currently on our website use Shopify for our Dahlia tuber sales and our dried flower reads and those kinds of things. So we have a retail Shopify um, and then we have a separate Shopify that will be, be for florists. Bethany asked if we refrigerate our zinnias. Um, the zinnias that go in bouquets go in the cooler, but our zinnia bunches we keep out of the cooler. Um, the, your biggest mistake and who made it uh we we i always make the biggest mistakes by far <laughs> and then gretel makes the second biggest mistakes on the farm <laughs> yeah. our mistakes are thousand dollar mistakes you know an employee makes a mistake and it's 50 bucks 100 bucks um i did i would say i uh went out to do some tilling one night and forgot that we had planted lilies and when we used to plant field lilies, plant lilies in a bed uh, earlier that day, and I, I prepped that bed, but there were already lilies planted, so that was a big mistake. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's part, part of farming is 
learning from those mistakes and figuring out how you can do better next time. That's the, the good thing about getting the seasonal like reset, you know, is that you can sort of through the winter recap the things that you thought maybe could have gone better and figure out how to how to make that happen. So we're always kind of learning from our mistakes, I think. Amber asks us how we build relationships with designers. I think for us, it's it's the one thing that really, really uh, works is is coming through for them when they need you. Um, that's how we get a lot of our floors at first. You know, they, they need something and, and we kind of make their day. Um, that always helps, that, that works. Um, and then, you know, if, if we're just honest with them. So if, if we don't have something, we communicate that to them. We try and be completely upfront with them. And I think just providing them with fresh flowers, giving them what they ask for, uh, just good quality customer service, I think is the best way for us to build relationships. And then, you know, we have personal relationships with some of them now, so getting personal. <laughs> So do you pay yourselves a salary is a question that was asked. So we do, um, we are a sole proprietor, like we're an LC, LLC, but we're still an individual like owners to our joint, we're married couples, so it's considered a joint venture. Um, and so we can't technically like take a paycheck, but we do like an owner's draw from the business um, once a week. And from there, from the owner's draw, some of it goes into our HSA account and then some of it goes into like other investments and that's all kind of automatically just set up through through our bank accounts. Um, how do you get rid of insects on the flowers at the time of harvest? Um, if they're bad we don't harvest them. Yeah. We've we've had uh, years where <laughs> uh we were throwing out 70 percent of the anemones because they had aphids all over them. Um, so if they're bad, we just don't harvest them. Yeah, and then like with dahlias, if there's cucumber beetles, you know, most of them are gonna fly out. I mean, we don't harvest things that have have damage. We used to bag the dahlias, but this year we planted over 20,000 dahlias. So there's no way that we were gonna bag them all. Um, so, you know, we were just more selective in our in our harvest process. Do we have crop insurance? We do not have crop insurance. Ohio does not, not really know how to do specialty crops yet. Um, we've talked to people in Oregon and other places that are flower farmers that are able to get crop insurance, but we they haven't really figured that out yet here since we're not a big grain farm. It doesn't, it's hard to figure out how it applies to lots of individual specialty crops. So even veggie growers, you know, if you're pretty diversified, um, you have a lot of other crops that can make up. Say you have a crop failure in your lettuce and lettuce makes up, you know, 15, 20% of your sales, then um, if you have to have a failure of basically on everything across the board uh, in, in order to reap the benefits of the crop insurance. If you have 20% loss, but everything else does well, then you, you're not eligible for crop insurance in most, most states. Um, someone asked, where do you get wholesale tubers and bulbs to start with? I, um, I put, I'm going to put in the text box, Burby and Glockner um, are two, two of our favorite sources for, for wholesale tubers. Um, you have beautiful pictures. Thank you, Angie. Do you take them yourself or do you have a photographer? I take them myself, so that's something that I really enjoy. Um, is taking photos of the flowers and like I said good photos sell sell product so um, you know it's important to to get those shots to really show the color of what the dahlias look like and things like that. Um, Someone asked about tillers. Uh, we do use tillers. Um, we also run uh, uh, perfect a cultivator through and so we don't rototill in this. Uh, we have a few tractors, not enough tractors. We um, mechanically cultivate, so we use those for weed control. So we've got we've got quite quite a few tractors here. There is an article in Growing for Market about our like mechanical mechanical cultivation um, and some of the, the tractors that we have and sort of how we, we use that in the system. We started using mechanical cultivation when we were about like three acres um you know when it became too much for like wheel hoeing since we don't use plastic um on the farm 
Thank you, Tim, for the whole farm revenue um, suggestion that we did look into that. Yeah. Um, what camera are you using? My iPhone. And do you cultivate everything? Are your flowers planted in single rows or beds? How does that work? So we transplant most stuff. We direct seed um, sunflowers. We direct seed some things, sunflowers, zinnias, cosmos, amaranth. Grasses, millets, ornamental grasses, yeah, yeah broom corn, things like but that. But everything, um, for the most part, outside of the dahlias, everything else is four row, um, 10 inch spacing. So everything is standardized to that four row. So all my cultivation equipment uh, uh, matches that 10 inch spacing. Oh, wow, this is going really fast. Okay, so we're just, we're gonna try and, yeah, speed, speed through some of these things. Um, this is our product database. We had someone build us in Excel. Um, so this helps us keep track of inventory. It has the day that the order is going out and we have all our products built in here. Eventually I would like to sell this inventory system, but right now we're in year, this will be year three of utilizing the system. And so I'm really trying to figure out how it can spit out harvest lists and, um, you know, assign harvesters and, and really like fully communicate everything that we, that we need. So, um, this has been a really big, big change for us. So this is what we used before Excel. We just had like an inventory sheet, the crop, the color, and then we would tally up how many we started with. And then typically on Mondays while we were bunching, Steve would be calling florists. And so as they get sold, um, then they would get marked off in the sold column and then we would kind of know what was available. So right now our system spits out this excess inventory list and this is what we sell off of. So there's not, not a lot of hash marks. And when we were doing it the other way, it was like certain colors of highlighters meant one thing and there was a lot of white out and, you know, math mistakes and things like that. So having it all in Excel is definitely, definitely a big, it's been a big difference for us. Um, and the inventory is searchable without having to filter through all the invoices. So like if we are short on tan amaranth, I can put tan amaranth at the top and, and pull it up and it'll tell me everybody who ordered it for that week so that we can, um, we can change, change their orders or sub things in. Um, so the orders get entered into our Excel inventory system and I create the harvest list um, from that. We input the orders and then Monday after everything is bunched, everybody, we used to do individual inventory sheets, but now we use like a master whiteboard that has the inventory on it. So that way I don't have to add them up. Um, and then it tells me what still needs harvested on Tuesday for florists. Um, so these are just examples of har harvest lists. There's a grocer harvest day on the left and that's mainly like buckets and stuff um, since we're making bouquets and then a florist harvest day on the right. So this is also in our Excel system and it's got the number of sold and the, and the extra to harvest. And then that way the, the crew knows, um, you know, if they can only get one that the other four were extra for him to put on the truck. So really like what's important is that one bunch of begonias instead of like the five. Um, so that's helped them sort of be a little bit more self-managed out in the field if they have questions about quantities and stuff. So um, this is, an example of our newsletter that we send out to the florist. So it has sunny meadows, it's got pretty pictures, um, a little message about what's going on at the farm. This year we built a Dahlia catalog um, because we realized that people's view of colors is different than our a description um, as much as I tried. So this is an example here of this is the Dahlia catalog that we built. So that way they can order specifically by name if they have a really particular bride, if they need a specific shade. Otherwise they can say, you know, I just need 30 bunches in the like PG range and they can take different ones um, or they just need like assorted colors. But this has really helped us with the florist communicate color wise um, because people definitely see colors differently. And that, that's been helpful. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Then this is also our sale, like, you know, sales list, the price list that goes out with our availability. And then it continues. So this was a week that we had a lot available. So I think it was like in September. 
um, and then pictures and then just like thank you for supporting us. So this is what goes out every Thursday to our florists and in MailChimp you can just kind of like duplicate your last um, your last campaign and then make any changes and add new photos and stuff. Um, somebody said, who does the input into the Excel inventory system? I have a lady who helps me with sales. She does the input of all the orders. And then I do the input of like what was bunched that day. Um, and then we kind of work together on like what is available um, for people. Cause she, she handles the sales email also. How many stems in the florist bunches? They're 10 and less otherwise noted. So there's some things that are five, dahlias are five, um, hydrangeas are five, the big expensive things are five. And then there's some stuff that's a grower's bunch, which just means it's like, it's gonna fill the sleeve. Um, okay, seasonal projected availability. This is on our website, so I'm not gonna click to this, but our flower availability there has a list of everything um, by month and then from that month you can click through and it goes to our Pinterest board. So, you know, all of these tools are things that we've built over the years uh, and with the help of, you know, people helping me in the office and just as far as time goes to create this. But the more like things that you can have like this out here, the, the more information that you can get out there, the more that people can kind of answer their own questions. So it's important, you know, on your website to have have all of these things um so that way people can see um this is just a one of the months of the like seasonal projected availability and then we also for florists will pull by budget and color palette so for there's a lot of new designers out there they don't necessarily know flower types they just have a color palette for a wedding and need something specific so this was you know a pe peachy blushy wedding with some pink um, and then we've been talking about communication a lot, but um, you know, that's definitely the biggest thing for us. It's, it's really hard to disappoint somebody when you don't have what they want, but we try not to over promise. And then if something happens, we let them know as soon as we know that it's, that it's happening, you know? Um, and if there's something that went wrong, then let them know how you'll do better for them next time. You know, they wanna know that their business is important and they wanna know that that their order's not always gonna like have something go wrong with it, you know, so. The hardest part of this business is disappointing people. Um, you know, whether that is is the end of the season when you don't have any more dahlias and they want more dahlias or, or they think that something's a different color and then they get it or, you know, something just doesn't hold up. Um, so it, that, that feels really crappy when that's going on, but it's kind of how you respond to that and how you communicate um, what you're going to do next time or how you can make it better for them um, is that's what's important. Retain their business, yeah. yeah. So then wholesalers, we sell some to wholesalers. We sell to Mayash up in Cleveland. Um, we've been shipping to some other wholesalers uh, around the nation too. So they take the highest volume, but you also get the lowest price. So as thinking about you know starting out i would say to do to do some do some retail stuff get yeah. in with some get in with some florists first and learn a little bit about the floral like industry as far as how bunches are sold like what is normal um and then need the separate pricing structure so we just separated out our wholesale flower sales this year because that way you don't have to change all the prices in quickbooks every time you make an invoice it just is every item is, is wholesale since they get a different price than the florist. And some of them may not want you to be selling to florists in your area. So someone asked about wholesalers not buying a lot. Um, so we have that issue with our local wholesalers. So we sell mostly to wholesalers up in Cleveland and that's a way for us to expand our reach without having to deliver direct to florists up there. The, floor, the wholesalers here in Columbus, like I think, you know, think that we're competition. So they don't buy a lot from us. They mainly only buy from us if there's an emergency. Um, okay, this is our van. This is, uh, you know, a load, load of bouquets going out. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a sprinter that makes a lot of the deliveries. We also have a refrigerated box truck. So this is what is mainly out on Wednesdays when Steve's doing the florist deliveries. 
And then dealing with future orders. So we do take future orders. Um, we use a seasonal projected availability. And then we tell people we check in, check in two weeks out um, if they, if, yeah, if, to, just to confirm with them quantities. And then that way that gives them time to get them from someone else if they need to. And then maintaining those relationships, just feedback loops. So we meet with some of our top customers to hear their thoughts. Like each winter, we send out a florist survey. Um, we keep track of sales so we can determine which, which products to cut, like things that didn't sell well. Sometimes things that we like are not, not what sells well. Be open to feedback and don't take it personal and accept responsibility if something went wrong. Um, so I think that that's, yeah, we've talked about relationships. Um, somebody said thoughts on paper versus plastic sleeves. Um, we do both the paper when we compared was like 25 cents a sleeve and the plastic is about nine cents a sleeve. Um, we've also started like not sleeving some products and just using like two rubber bands to like hold the bunch together um, so that we're not not using as many sleeves. Uh, we use paper on Lizzie's so that it's there's more airflow and then we use plastic for for a lot of the things. Some of the florists will give the sleeves back to us too. And this is just pulling florist orders so we shop the invoice and that way the order is in one bucket or you know multiple buckets. Their buckets are separated out when they go on the truck and then that way anything that's left over is extra goes on the truck with Steve. And then strategies, open and honest communication, try not to overpromise. It's all about service. Um, focus on high quality product at a fair price and, and focus on marketing stuff. Does it, so I have just, we've just got like, we've got less than 10 minutes left. So this, you know, we can take more questions if you guys have questions that you weren't asking like throughout. Um, otherwise, I can I can just keep going to um, to to finish it out. Um, so Christy said plastic really going out of favor in New Zealand with some of our big growers using paper. Interesting to see. Yeah. So there was you know when we there was some like kickback when we switched our bouquets into into plastic. Um, but it just meant that we didn't have to sticker the sleeve. So we were using a, like putting a sticker like on, on all of them and paying for those stickers to get printed. And so now the sleeve is branded and then we had just have like a UPC printer that, that gets the print, gets the stickers on there. Um, so that's why we started also not sleeving some of the stuff. Yeah. And they are actually the plastic that we use is, is recyclable at the places that can take the like number five plastic, like the film that produce stuff comes in. Um, okay, so quality control, learning about standard bunch sizes, bringing them professional product, and then bunches for retail or grocer stem count can, can be different. Um, how to determine fair pricing. So, you know, make sure that you're not undercutting like those people around you. We don't want it to be like a race to the bottom. Um, farmers market flowers should not be like the the cheapest option that is like a retail um, retail outlet and so you know knowing that you have quality product just making sure that you're you're charging what you what your value is knowing enterprise budgets helps you know um, typically you can check with a wholesaler in your area and get on their list and then you'll be able to see what florists are paying for flowers um, and then, yeah, just working together to really teach people that farm flowers don't mean cheap flowers. Um, you know, that this is there a lot of tough work. So here's a couple pricing examples. We do Lizzie's by the bloom because we sell the first cut. Uh, the first cut we cut is like the, you know, almost the whole plant comes down. So sometimes there's up to like 13 blooms on them. Um, and then the second cut are more individual stems. So that way it's, we sell by bloom count so that it's the same size bunch. Um, well, same number of open blooms in a bunch that they know that they're getting. So yeah, this just breaks down the different pricing examples. Wholesaler, $9. Florist, $16. Retail, $20. And then the grocer, since they're only $5, only gets like a half bunch in their bunch. Um, and then zinnias, all 12 stem bunches, 
the wholesalers four, florists are eight, and retail is 12. So you can see that there is, you know, a, a significant like difference between between all of those. And that again is we want our florists to be able to charge enough to make it worth it for them to buy our stuff since it is our, our things are typically a little bit more expensive than they would be from the wholesaler. But the idea is that there's not not any shrinkage, you know, the flowers are fresh coming straight to them. Yeah, and then just identifying your brand, putting your face in your photos, telling your story and just educating people about the value of buying local. So we can just, there's, oh, here's our marketing tools. So that's just our website. Um, you know, the things that we use in our email, we create canned responses. In MailChimp, we create some automated newsletters, you know, just trying to build some of those things in. Like if you have to answer the same question more than once and you have Gmail, Gmail has, I think they're called templates now, but basically canned responses. So that way um, you don't have to type that, that out and think about it again. So we have one that is the initial florist inquiry, like the initial grocery inquiry, uh, for any frequently asked questions, photographers, things like that. Um, someone said, what platform did you use to build your website or did you have someone else make it? We had someone else make it. They're called the Wonder Jam. Um, they're a company that's here locally, um, but they uh, can work remotely as well. But they're really great. I think that they really conveyed the message that we wanted to and they've got, you know, got it nice and bright and colorful. Um, like like we want people's you know perception of the farm is that there's it's wild and abundant and colorful so i feel like that comes off uh in the website do you have carl says do you have any thoughts about conducting online flower cur courses during the off season um like i don't you mean arranging classes or just like kind of what we're what we're doing here like teaching stuff um we are yeah so we we are, we do bouquet classes here at the farm, but I don't, um, I haven't thought about an online flower course though, but that is, that is a good idea. All right. There's, yeah, just a couple other good, good websites, you know, just answering, answering questions for people so that, so that you don't have to having a good frequently asked questions page, just communication again with customers um so this is you know on our website as well i have more slides but it doesn't look like we're going to get through all of them social media like we were talking about instagram facebook you know creating some tags encourage people to tag you when they post their photos that's what's always cool about after the farmer's market seeing people post pictures of the flowers or you know if you're growing veggies like posting food that they're making with your with your vegetables or your meat that you're growing um you know is really cool to kind of see that full cycle and that's that's what we really liked about the dried flower wreaths too because that's more of like a decor piece in their home that's more permanent than you know just a bouquet that's going to sit on the table and so that's we always like seeing pictures of them in use okay does anyone have like any other questions that we haven't yeah, have any last questions for Gretel and Steve before we say good night. Thank you everybody for listening. Oh, we're yeah, excited that that um everyone came. And we also yeah, we um we do like farmer consultations. I mean, if you're welcome to email us uh with with more questions if you have any follow up from that or you know, like I said earlier if you want specific numbers or you know talk about crop playing talk about our tractors that we use anything anything that you want to know um you know the farmer consultation is, is where it's at and there were a couple of questions people have that folks had throughout the um presentation where they wanted you to type in some responses and i tried to keep track of those the best i could so i'll be sending an email out to all of you attendees 
um, tomorrow sometime. Thanking you again for being here tonight. And I'll include some of those notes. So just in case you missed it in the chat box tonight, but you, you know, had wished you'd written it down, I did keep a couple of notes and I'll share those. And I don't know, Steve and Gretel, if you guys can or want to share your presentation um, for some of those slides that maybe we didn't get to, but we could always potentially send that out as well. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely do that. Yeah, because there's a few more just about, yeah, creating, yeah, creating content and social media and that kind of stuff. Um, and then it also has our, our email in there. Um, okay. The email address that you should use for us is info at sunnymeadowsflowerfarm.com but if you go to our website there's also a contact form so you can you can use that um someone said how much for consultation it's 150 dollars an hour and then we also have an all day we haven't haven't had anybody do the all day one yet but we also do have an all day one where you would come and just basically shadow us and and answer you know we would answer any questions and see our flow and, and all of that so um that is also an option awesome well, thank you so much gretel and steve yeah. this has been a really good presentation to sit in on i know i learned a lot and based on the comments and the questions i think that our attendees have as well 